Hello everybody, I'm Dan. Welcome to my Java tutorial series. Throughout my tutorials I will teach you Java using just Notepad and the command prompt. The order in which my tutorials are organized on both my website at javacjava.com and my YouTube playlist is designed to maximize learning by building on concepts from prior tutorials. This tutorial is about the Byte class. I'm going to open up my web browser to my website, javacjava.com, select the Begin button, and scroll all the way down to the Byte class. The Byte class is a wrapper class that wraps a value of a primitive Byte data type into an object. I highly recommend watching my Primitive Wrapper Classes tutorial, Primitive Numeric Typecasting tutorial, and my Autoboxing tutorial before continuing with this tutorial. You will need to understand certain concepts from all of them in order to fully comprehend the material in this tutorial. It is important to note that the byte class is immutable. So the fields are constants. The byte class contains a total of five class variables that are essentially constants. Bytes, max value, min value, size, and type. I will show examples of how to access these members, but type is beyond the scope of this tutorial thus far, so no go. Constructors. The byte class does not have a no argument constructor. The class has two public constructors. Um, one takes a byte value as a parameter, and the other one takes a string value as a parameter. Methods. The byte class has about 20 methods, so I won't list all of them here, but I will demonstrate how to use some of the methods in the example code. Let's come down here, and I'm just going to simply click and hold down, then use my down arrow on my keyboard to slowly, controllably get all this stuff here. Control C to copy, or right click and select copy. I'm going to move, move my browser off screen here. I've got a shortcut to the command prompt on my desktop, but if you don't, you can create one really quick by right clicking, selecting new, then shortcut. CMD, next finish, it's just that easy. Okay, let's open it up, type in Java C, which is Java compiler command, press enter. Now you're gonna see all this stuff scroll by. If you get an error message, watch my tutorial on installing the Java development kit. You wanna make sure you get that installed and configured properly before continuing. CD space backslash, CD is short for change directory, backslash tells it to go to the root. I'm going to make a directory with the MD command called Java, and I already have it, but if you don't, you can create one really easy there. I'm going to make another directory here, and I am just going to call this one uh, byte class, and change directories to the byte class folder there. And then I'm also going to notepad ByteClass.java. ByteClass.java is going to be the name of my source code file, also known as a compilation unit. Let's go ahead and paste this stuff in here. Okay, and you know, did that? We have Control V. You could also right-click and select paste. But anyway, I'm going to go ahead and file and save. The first thing I'm going to do is just go ahead and compile and run this here. So let's clear our screen. Java C file name we want to compile. Java, and we want to invoke the byte class. I'm going to scroll all the way back up here so uh, we can kind of go this through this line by line here. Um, number of bytes in a byte, right? And these are the constant, bytes.byte. So there's one byte in a byte. And that's great. That's pretty profound. So we were expecting that though. Number of bits in a byte, eight. So the math works out there. Uh, the minimum value, uh, or maximum value of a byte, 127. Minimum value of a byte, negative 128, right? And that's all of these constants here, fields. So now we'll talk about the constructors here. Um, I got this reference variable i1, and I'm setting that equal to a byte type, right? And that is going to, I'm setting that equal to a new instance of a new byte object, and I'm calling the byte constructor that takes a byte um, as a parameter. And notice that I have to cast that if I'm just going to use an integer literal here. So I cast this to a, a byte so that matches the, the argument will then match the parameter, right? And then um, I display that to the console here. And then I also use its um, string constructor basically the string parameter for the constructor on that and display that to the console. So that's the two constructors there and how to use them. Fairly simple on that. Okay, now let's do common methods here, right? Um, let's switch back over here real quick and kind of start coming down here a little bit. All right, so they have the compare method here. Uh, let's see. 
I'm just gonna put a little space in here. So basically I've got two, um, two variables here, byte temp, um, reference variable temp, and a reference variable temp2. Both are of the byte class type, right? And I'm setting them both equal to zero. And this auto box is the temp refer reference variable for examples, right? And the temp2 reference variable. So the signature for the byte value here basically is this. Um, and of course it's not static and it returns a byte type. So it basically return the value as a byte and it may lose data if, if it's outside of the bounds there. So um, as a matter of fact, it'll produce a compiler. I'll show you here in a second. So I'm setting um, our byte type object, right? Equal to 41. And I, I don't have to cast it when I do this, this sort of auto boxing stuff there. It'll handle all that for me there. And then if I set byte B, equal to uh, temp dot byte value, right? And I can display that up there. That's just going to simply display byte B 41, right? Okay, and now what happens if I were to try, for, for example, to say like temp equals 201 and auto box uh, number into there larger than one it'll actually hold. Let's go ahead and save this here, I'll show you. get a compiler error. Incompatible types, int cannot be converted to byte. So that's basically what happens there when you try, try to get something that's too large there, right? Okay, let's go ahead and save that. Compile up here, recompile that, rerun it, and we want to be right about here. Okay, so our next one down here is the compare method, right? It takes two parameters, uh, first byte x and byte y, and it returns an int data type, and it's static, so we can directly call it, right? So it compares the parameters for compares the parameters for quality, and it returns the value of the first parameter minus the second parameter, right? So if these guys are equal, it's going to return back a zero, right? And otherwise, it's just going to use that particular expression there. First parameter minus the second parameter, and that's what it's going to do. Now, that's nothing like, for example, the integer class. If you watch my video on integer and the compare, it returns either a 0, a negative 1, or a, um, a positive 1 there on that. So this is nothing functions. The compare here functions nothing like it does in the integer class. Okay. And of course we have to typecast these, these integer literals and we do that, so that goes without saying on that. But basically, so the result of the compare for 36, 36, that equals 0, uh, 30, 40, negative 10, we take the first parameter minus the second parameter, it's negative 10, and then this, uh, this last one here, 40 minus 30, 10. So that's basically the way the compare um, operator works there, right? Okay, and of course that's a static one here. Now, um, there's a compare to, which takes a byte object parameter here, right? And it will compare the byte parameter against the current object. And it returns the value of the first parameter minus the second parameter, right? Once again, this is nothing like the integer compared to um, either. The integer compared to basically does the same thing as like, um, the compare in the integer class there will return like zero, negative one, or positive one. So here I'm auto boxing temp to 35 and temp two to 35, and then displaying that to the console here on the compare to. 35, 35 is zero, and then I'm setting the temp two equal to 40, right? So 35 and 40 is a negative five, and it's basically subtracting those out there. And then for the final one here, I'm setting temp to equal to 30, right? So 35 and 30, that is five there. Okay, um, so that's the compare to. Now let's come down here to the decode. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll up a little bit here. <coughs> So the decode method, it's static as well, takes a string parameter, returns back a byte object type. Um, so it returns the byte value from a string. And string parameter can be decimal, hexadecimal, or octal, right? So um, basically, you know, putting in like negative 128, right? And then decoding that, right? It's a string value here. 
on the first one there. So that equals negative 128. And then I'm using the hexadecimal representation uh, prefix, basically 0x, right? Or they also allow the pound sign there. So 2a, hexadecimal 2a on both of these example. And that equals uh, basically 42 decimal, right? And then the last one, I'm doing octal 0104 and decoding that string there, and that comes out to 68. So that's how the decode one works there, right? And of course, that returns back a byte, takes in a string. Okay, double value is very simple there. Simply returns a primitive double from the current object. So here I'm auto boxing 127 into a byte, um, byte basically type there, byte instance. And um, double D equals temp dot double value. And that'll just return back 127 as a double value and display that to the console there, right? 127.0. On the next one, equals, right? Equals, and this is the signature here. Um, pass it an object type there, and it'll return true or false. So return true if the value of the current object is equal to the value of the parameter, right? So I'm auto boxing 41 into the temp byte instance there, and um, then calling temp dot equals, and then I'm casting a integer literal 41 as a byte type and seeing if they're equal. Okay. True. Okay. Now the interesting thing about it is you can go ahead and run this next line here without casting it in there and what you'll get is you'll actually get false. It doesn't return an error back or anything like that, but that does not, equals doesn't quite exactly work like that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I'm not entirely sure why, but I just thought I'd point that out. If we put a typecast on here, it, it equals true. If we don't typecast it, it equals false. So typecasting appears to be incredibly um, important on some of these parameter values here. Okay, so float, uh, the next one is float value, right? And that one will simply return back um, a float. Returns a primitive float from the current object. So temp, I'm auto boxing that to 100. And temp.float value, that returns back a float from there and then just displaying that to the console, 100 on that. Okay, so hash code. Um, hash code returns the hash code for the current byte object, right? As an int type, actually. And so it returns the primitive int value represented by this byte object. So temp up here is still equal to 100. And we call hash code, it's just actually going to return back exactly that, 100. Um, and then there's a static version of ha hash code, which is overloaded here, that you can pass it in a um, oh, this should say byte value. That is a little off there. Okay, so this, this will take a byte value and return the hash code from it. So essentially it returns the same thing as, as the parameter, but you know, I'm not really sure of this, why they have this method in here. It doesn't make a whole lot of, a lot of sense, but let's go ahead and run it up anyway here. So um, byte hash code of you know, doing the typecasting byte of negative 23 equals negative 23. All right, I'm going to go ahead and scroll up a little bit on this one here. The next one is int value, and that returns a int primitive value from the current object. So int i equals temp dot int value. Temp at this point in time is still equal to 100, so we're good there. So it's just going to basically return back i equals 100. Long value, same thing, returns a long primitive value from the current object, right? Temp.long value, 100, right? And then we've got this parse byte here. And that returns back a, um, a byte primitive um, data type, and we pass it in a string, okay? Um, so basically, and it's static, so we can directly call it byte.parse byte. And then you can put the plus on here, it's optional. It's no different than if we did 87, but I just wanted to show you can do that there. Right, and so basically that'll assign it to a um, primitive variable, I parse one here and display that to the console there, 87. Okay, then there's an overloaded version of the parse byte here where you can, uh, they, they both return back a primitive byte type and one takes a string and the next is the radex. So returns the primitive byte value from the string parameter. 
The rate x parameter is essentially what base numbering system to use, right? So on base 10, which is our normal, you know, numbering system we use on a daily basis, that is going to return back negative 62 from this string parameter here, right? Um, if we specify like 8 for the radix uh, and put in 0, 2, 7, that's going to return back 23, which is the uh, decimal equivalent essentially of octal 27. And then negative 2a, which is hexadecimal, 16 here, that'll return back negative 42, or display negative 42 when we get up and get that back there. So, all right, uh, short value, that's that's another pretty simple one there. Um, let's see, we're getting close to close to all of them here. That, um, that will just simply returns a short primitive value from the current object, and I'm out of boxing 100 into the temp um, byte object there. And invoking the short value, which returns back the 100 in short type there, right? And that's one equals 100. Next thing, two string returns a string object from the current object, right? So string type back. So out of boxing 100 back into that temp uh, byte instance there. And temp dot two string. Right, setting that equal to string ts there and then displaying ts to the console, right? ts equals 100. And then there's another two string that is overloaded, which is static, that we can just simply pass in a byte parameter and it'll convert it right into a string return type there. So it returns a string object from the parameter. String ts1 equals byte.toString, and I'm casting the integer literal 45 as a byte type in there. And that'll basically return TS1 equals 45. <clears throat> okay, now we've got um, value of. Now, value of returns a byte um, object, right, and takes in a primitive byte parameter. Okay, so returns a byte object from primitive byte parameter. So temp, I'm setting that, and it's static to temp equals byte dot value of, and I'm casting the 118 integer literal into byte type there, and that returns that back as a byte object, which you can directly set into the temp here, and then display that to the console there. And that is the 118 right up here. Okay. Um, now there's, an also, there's also another overloaded version of the um, byte of the value of method here that takes a string parameter, right, and returns back a byte um, object type, byte instance type here. So, and it's static too. So byte.value of, and then I'm passing the string literal 19 here, and then I'll assign that to temp2, and then displaying that to the console there, temp2 equals 19. Okay, and then we have one more uh, last method here, which is value of, and we it's, um, takes a string as its first parameter, right? I should probably actually say something like string s there. And returns a byte object uh, value from the string parameter, right? So the first one here, I can pass a string little 120 and say the 10, the base 10 decimal system there, right? Temp 3 equals 120. The next one, um, passing in the string literal 2c, which is a hexadecimal, and 16 rec represents hexadecimal, so that's 44. The last one, octal 017, 8 represents octal, and that will basically return that one back, display that to the console, and that's 15. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that, get rid of that, and just leave you with some final thoughts there. So, uh, the byte wrapper class provides you with the tools to easily convert between objects and primitive types. That concludes this tutorial. Thanks for watching.